Welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, my name is Maria. I'm going to be the moderator and I will also be the point of contact. So I will type in the chat box my email and if you have any other questions at the end of the webinar, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, this is going to be the first of two webinars. Uh, the other webinar is going to be next Wednesday. It will have two other keynote lectures and we'll uh, deep dive in another part of our master's program. So <coughs> to also register in the other webinar uh, if you are interested. Um, another thing that we would like to mention is that given the number of people joining, uh, we have turned off your microphones. Uh, we'll be uh, using um, our chat. Uh, uh, so feel free to type there and I will be there to answer any questions you might have. Uh, but if you have bigger questions, please wait until the end of the webinar because we'll have a Q&A session where our professors and colleagues will be there to answer uh, and uh, talk better with you. Um, tomorrow, I will also be sharing a recording of this webinar. I will also share uh, the presentations of my colleagues uh, so you can really be focused uh, today during this uh, webinar. Uh, as to the agenda, uh, we'll start with an introduction to our program by Yap Aver, Senior Lecturer in Water and Environmental Policy. After that, we'll have two keynote lectures by Asela Patirana, Associate Professor in Water Infrastructure Asset Management, and Konstantina Belkushanova, Senior Lecturer in Non-Sewer Sanitation. After that, we'll uh, end with a Q&A session that I just mentioned, uh, where uh, besides the professors, also my colleague, Ina Kamelis will be there as coordinator of fellowship and admission office. Uh, yep, uh, would you like to set in and uh, start your introduction? Maria and um... Good to see so many people already online. Welcome to this uh, webinar, also from my introduction to our master program in water and sustainable development. And I share a very nice picture here, but I think I need to change this picture with this because this is what you might be actually coming for, to um, have an interest to continue your learning journey, uh, potentially here at IHE, and that maybe one day, just like our uh, these people on this picture, you leave maybe this institute with this uh, blue tube containing a diploma in water and sustainable development. And then you are one of the more than uh, 25,000 alumni that we have as an institute from all over the world, more than 190 countries that um, have are part of this IHE water family, continuing to add their knowledge and experience and skill to improving our water systems and to contribute to a more water sustainable and just society. My name is uh, Jaap Evers. I'm a um, senior lecturer in water and environmental policy here at IHC Delft um, since already 2012. And in that sense, I'm also a member of the water governance department. Um, I'm also one of the program coordinators of this um, MSc in Water and Sustainable Development and as such part of the program committee that is responsible for the organization of this program. Um, in this presentation, I give a rapid introduction on how our program works and with a particular focus on the um, water hazards, risk and climate um, track and also the um, water and health track. So let us first go to our track of water hazards, risks, and climate. So you are likely already very much uh, related to uh, some of you, at least, uh, into the, 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 the story about climate change. And maybe in your countries, you are also working already on climate change adaptation plans, and you are aware of how climate change is impacting on our water systems. and. Maybe then you are also aware that in the last 
decades, the, the reports from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, is bringing out more and more alarming results um, or more alarming messages. And so climate change is actually changing much more rapid than we had um, uh, expected in the past. And also the impacts of it might be more severe than we expected in the past. And also that climate change is irreversible. It's, it's here to stay and we need to deal with it for quite a while, even when we are reducing our greenhouse gas emissions with quite a lot. Um, and we are, of course, putting as a global community many efforts in it. Um, and that is some things that we are actually uh, that you would be able to study in this uh, in this track. So the kinds of water hazards um, like floodings from either sea level or rivers or the extended droughts or hence increased monsoons and hurricanes. Um, how can you study this from these different perspectives? Uh, so I, the, the, the causes and consequences, the impacts of it, but also from the solutions. Uh, so you could think of more engineering solutions, but maybe more uh, uh, nature-based solutions, but also thinking about the governance solutions, what are kind of governance setups in either financing um, certain climate change adaptation uh, approaches. Um, so another aspect of this is uh, then, so, okay, what are the, 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 the uh, so the, the problem with climate change and also the solutions is that there is a lot of unknowns in it. Uh, so what are the, the probabilities of climate change, but what are also um, the likelihood that the things that we are developing um, actually going to work and that they have a positive impact and how can we then actually plan for the implementation of those things? What are the different stakeholders and how can we organize that? So these are all kinds of these things that will be discussed when you would uh, choose for this track. And I said, either you can choose it for more engineering kind of profiles or more governance and management profiles, or you would be maybe more interested in hydroinformatics and uh, digital innovation, in which you look at maybe um, developing innovative models and maybe using um, artificial intelligence to contribute to that better understanding of the system. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that you can look um, at these problems, solutions uh, in this track. And so if you like to contribute uh, to your societies or our global society's ability to deal uh, with climate change adaptation, um, this track might be definitely something for you. So the next track is um, water and health. And well, where you might think that uh, climate change adaptation is a big issue, well, safe water and sanitation is also a very big issue. Right? So safe access to safe water, uh, clean water, and um, sanitation service are primary drivers, of course, for our public health. And even access to clean water and safe sanitation are considered as human rights. So to be able to thrive as a human, communities, we need safe water and sanitation services. And even though we have, as a global community, made these intentions with the Sustainable Development Goal, and in this sense, Sustainable Development Goal 6 on clean water and sanitation, we are still lagging behind. And so three out of 10 people in the world still do not have access to safely managed uh, drinking water service and uh, six out of 10 people in the world still do not have access to safely managed sanitation. And even when we might have access to sanitation services, we have access to toilets, either um, publicly or privately, then those waste flows from those toilets, but also other waste flows 
are most of the time not treated. And so 80% of the wastewater flows are flowing into our surface water bodies, into rivers, into wetlands, into the oceans um, without any treatment. And of course, without proper treatment of these um, waste flows, they are contaminating actually the actual environment from which we actually also take our water to be used for drinking water uh, services. So when we think of um, sanitation and clean drinking water, uh, we also in this program, we really address this from a systems perspective, either sometimes being called in the, in the, in the chain uh, from producer of wastewater to uh, the, 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 where the treated waste flows re-enter in our ecosystems or from um, a water chain from water production, extraction of water from our surface of groundwater, purification and the distribution to our uh, end users, but also in this more uh, large ecosystems approach. And this is with the um, with the previous track on water hazards. Uh, also here, we can study these issues from an engineering perspective. Uh, what are the kind of te uh, innovative technologies for wastewater treatment, uh, on-site wastewater treatment, or decentralized wastewater treatment versus centralized treatment, pre-treatment, post-treatment, um, et cetera. But also think about what the distribution networks uh, in case of um, water, drinking water services. But we also can think, okay, what is the organization of drinking water? Uh, there's a lot of debate on uh, private companies in drinking water services provision or public drinking water service provisions, or maybe even a mix of both. So again, uh, because we um, at IHC, I think in all tracks, we, uh, we take these systems approaches to understanding our water challenges, but also our water solutions. We, it requires that we take these multidisciplinary um, perspectives of understanding these problems. And that is um, represented also in our program and how our program is organized. So let me go to that next step. So in simple terms, our program structure looks like this. We have a um, modular setup, um, which means that um, you basically take one course at a time uh, and a module is the same as a course um, in which we start with um, eight modules, eight courses, um, which you, you can select um, yourself, um, but you select those courses in, in, uh, in line with your research or your learning interest or your learning needs. And together with a coach, um, you make that selection of your own portfolio of modules. Um, in between those modules, we also have mixed weeks. So you see in the in the graph that we start in November and then we have first module one, which is an introduction module um, and which is an introduction module for the whole group of students. Um, then it continues in module two, which is track based. So you would see an introduction to water hazards, risk and climate, for example, or the introduction to water and health. And then you see that in between module two and three, there is a so-called mixed week. And in these mixed weeks, uh, we first organize um, exams, either on Monday and Tuesday, and then it continues with um, uh, skills development course. Uh, so we very much see your academic education, not just an education to develop your uh, your knowledge skills, but that for um, to be a, a comprehensive uh, professional or academic, it also requires other skills. Uh, and you can think of writing skills, presentation skills, but in the mixed week, uh, coming week that we are organizing, we also have um, science communication skills that we are, uh, well, uh, developing together with you. Next to that, you also see here 
that I mentioned, portfolio reflection. So as I mentioned, together with your codes, you are developing your portfolio. Your portfolio consists of your learning trajectory. So the courses that you are take with the ambition to acquire your own learning goals. Um, but in these weeks, you also have time to reflect on it and potentially maybe change your learning route. And that is a particular point uh, organized in our program to reflect on this. <clears throat> well, not unimportant to mention. So in module eight, after you have done your seven modules, there is an interdisciplinary project in France. Um, and in particular, in this interdisciplinary project, you will work with other colleagues from different tracks and different profiles to together um, study and propose uh, solutions to one of the water challenges that are presented in that case in France. And finally, when you have that, although the selection of your MSc thesis topic already starts more or less in February, then uh, you continue with your most important work maybe in your MSc studies, which is your MSc thesis research, in which during which you will work together with a supervisory team um, on your MSc thesis project. Well, that is what you would do um, when you are here. Um, but what we also offer um, in our program uh, is actually to prepare yourself maybe a little bit more before arrival here at IHC, but maybe it, when you are here at IHC, you also notice, hey, it is 10 years ago that I did my master's uh, of my bachelor's degree, and I need to update myself a little bit on some of the information. And therefore, we offer some of these prep courses. So how does that look like um, in reality? So, or in our schedule, so here you see an overview that we present all kinds of courses within the different tracks. And when you see these different colors, those colors represent different profiles. And we have these profiles of engineering and hydrology, governance and management, environment, sanitation, and digital innovation. And you can thus yourself, if you, for example, are in that water and health track, you can together with your coach, select the courses, your own learning trajectory. And it could look like this, that you start off with a few engineering courses and then move on maybe with a little bit more water management courses, or you might choose a learning trajectory that really focus on um, sanitation in this case, but it might also be that you think, hey, there are also course off courses offered in other tracks that are in of interest to me. And you are taking courses that are outside of your track and maybe uh, contribute to a more interdisciplinary profile. So a lot of possibilities are there. In, um, but what is important here is that you choose the courses that contribute to your learning objectives. So to sum up um, and finalize this presentation, some key features of our program. So we have customized study trajectories that you develop uh, your own uh, by yourself in relation with your coach and your coach supports you in building your program and support you in critically thinking about what kind of learning trajectory is uh, in your be most benefit. It's interdisciplinary. So, um, as institute, we offer knowledge and skills from asset to governance and sanitation to environment. Um, but also in the courses, we uh, take interdisciplinary approaches to, to um, get most from these different insights, from these disciplines in understanding problems and solutions. And we do that mostly via a problem-oriented curriculum. So you will see in many courses that you will work in a group on a certain case, on a certain problem. Um, and problem-based learning helps you to, to further develop your analytical skills in um, developing an understanding of problems, but also going 
to solutions. So it's not very uh, to, uh, theoretical in that sense, but we require you to apply theoretical and practical cases. And next to that, it's not just about your knowledge skills, but also about developing professional skills. To finalize, um, well, I hope to see you then one day here in Delft. Uh, Delft is a very nice historical city in the Netherlands, and I'm very much looking forward to meet you. Thank you very much. And then I give it back to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Jaap. Uh, I think it was very insightful. I hope everyone uh, uh, enjoyed it. Uh, we didn't have a lot of questions, so I think it was uh, very clear. Uh, now, Asela, uh, we can uh, go back to you uh, with a keynote about um, challenge of sustainability in water infrastructure. What is missing? I see my screen now uh, and good day to everyone. Welcome to this webinar. And uh, also thank you, Maria, for the introduction uh, and Yap uh, for the overview uh, of, the, of our program. So um, in the first presentation, Yap was talking about multidisciplinarity. So probably I think I would uh, approach my presentation um, showing that uh, that how we try to synthesize, you know, different knowledge from different uh, different thematic areas to solve very practical problems. Um, so um, I thought of uh, selecting one such problem that is, uh, hence the title, the challenge of sustainability in water infrastructure, what is missing. Um, so um, you all know that uh, water, uh, sector is in a challenge, uh, both due to uh, population growth and increasing demand, as well as the climate change that the previous speaker also mentioned. The future is extremely uncertain, but uh, at the same time, there are very scary uh, scenarios for which, as responsible citizens of the world, we have to be prepared To give an example, in the recent uh, climate change um, report, there is one scenario that talks about, uh, even though it's low likelihood, there can be 15 meters high uh, sea level rise that is not completely uh, ignored or ruled out. So this is one of the extremes, but you can see the level of challenges that we have to uh, we have to deal with uh, in the coming future. On the other hand, um, if you look at how uh, in the places where most people live, urban settings and so on, the water scarcity is a huge, huge problem. By 2050, World Bank estimates that we need to spend about 23 trillion US dollars in order to address this infrastructure gap, what we see in the uh, water sector. Now, this is my hypothesis. We are uh, introducing this problem. Everybody at least talks about it. Investments are there, even though not enough. We admit that. But my hypothesis here is engineering, technology, and project investments provide necessary sufficient conditions for the sustainability of those investments. So um, in other words, uh, the new technologies, uh, the engineering approaches, uh, the big project investments are unnecessary. But I would argue that they are not sufficient to make sure that humanity is going to be uh, with the right amount of water. Now. To give you a story, an anecdote, uh, in 2020, um, I, I traveled to the Maldives um, where you know, we were commissioning a desalination ba uh, based water uh, treatment plant. So this is a very modern uh, system, of course, small scale. So we were very proud about this. 
And um, I was taking an evening walk in this little island. And I went to the other side of the island. And this is what I saw. I saw another desalination plant. Uh, after questioning, I realized that it was from 2005. So not that old, 15 years old. But it's completely dilapidated, like nobody even knew about this. So this, this simple story tells a very important issue that we are facing as water professionals around the world. We, we ask for investment with good reasons, but uh, sometimes, you know, uh, we, we get caught up with this, uh, the need of investment money, and we forget that there is another equally uh, important responsibility to, uh, to sustain, to keep uh, this infrastructure running, working, uh, and, uh, and delivering services properly. Now, some people call this, uh, this challenge uh, a bit of uh, build, neglect, rebuild, or BNR cycle. So that is, you know, this is a recent report uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, we can find this kind of uh, findings from around the world. This is only one example. So what you see is that in spite of huge investments in the water sector, um, you get inadequate sustainable services. In this particular case, it's about flood protection infrastructure, but you can apply this for water supply, uh, sanitation, um, drainage, uh, anything. This is a reality that we are facing in the world. We, you know, the money we invest, the money we find with a lot of difficulty to invest, sometimes it's not optimally used because we forget uh, beyond the project, so to say. So uh, we are around the world, we are very much focused on the initial stage of service provision, that is creating new infrastructure. Uh, this is another example from the Caribbean, it's the same story. So um, um, my um, contention here is what can we do about it? To understand that we need to admit that we are at the moment, we are good at building stuff, but not very good at keeping them running. That's a reality, so we have to deal with that and we have to counter that situation, that reality. So that is where uh, the topic that I um, cover at IHG, that is water infrastructure asset management comes in. Because we say that this is the coordinated activities of an organization to mainstream the rational and systematic resource allocation decision making for optimal use of limited resources for good delivery and sustainability of its services. So in this topic, in this definition, we embrace the whole life cycle uh, of a solution, not only the building, not only the project that happens initially, but you know how it keeps on working and how it can deliver uh, the service for the, for the coming decades, if not centuries. And um, sometimes we use different terms to denote this. Generally, it is infrastructure asset management. At IHG Delft, we call it water infrastructure asset management because our business is dealing with water. And some people just call it asset management. But generally, how do we do that? Um, asset management is a very uh, common sense approach. Uh, of course, we don't do it very well at the moment, but it's very much common sense. So usually what we do is we look at two different areas. One is how we day-to-day -day run our, our infrastructure services. So these blue color bullets are about that. And then we also look at a little bit of the long range or the future picture. Those are those green color uh, bullets. So in the operational or the day-to-day -day world, we ask questions like, what do we have? So you, you will admit that these are very common sense questions. What do we have? That is the answer to that is we need to have a very comprehensive, uh, as complete as possible inventories of infrastructure. This is easier said than done, uh, said than done because when it comes to complex infrastructure like uh, flood uh, management systems, water supply systems, drainage, sometimes the hugely complicated. So understanding even this first issue is challenging. Then what is the condition of that? And what are the importance? What, what are the risks that, that create 
uh, is created by failure of these components and how to prioritize our investment uh, or the operational money. So those are the operational questions. Then we are looking at the future, both positive and negative issues of future. What, the, what will the future bring? Um, is it climate change? Um, can be climate change, population growth, depopulation in some cases, new innovations, all those things. Then we have to look at how we can finance that transformation that we are envisioning into that, into that future, addressing those future problems and capitalizing on future innovation. So these six questions we call is the key or the heart of the infrastructure asset management. Now, <clears throat> A very practical challenge that we face in many organizations, many water organizations, as well as other infrastructure organizations in the world, is that those um, people who are dealing with those green or strategic questions and people who are dealing with day-to-day -day drudgery of running a system, operational issues, they don't talk to each other. So one of the very important uh, premises of asset management is somehow we should get these two worlds in organization to talk to each other. So that is what this slide um, explains here. Um, talking about uh, the situation of asset management, we started delivering this topic at IHE Delft in 2007. Uh, so that was one of my very first uh, tasks at IHE to deliver uh, to develop this curriculum and start delivering it with a couple of other people. Uh, but we have come a long way. We can see that because uh, big players, uh, including International Finance Institute, have recognized the importance of uh, sustainability and asset management in our infrastructure investment. As shown by these examples of different uh, expert reports that uh, various big international organizations have uh, produced in the last decade or so. Now, as the final part of my presentation, I would like to show you some nuggets of, you know, how we do this in practice. Uh, one, uh, one important uh, practical element uh, in uh, asset management is look at investments from the uh, from the life cycle perspective. This is a little tool that we use in education to you know to uh, drive this idea home. I'm looking at different case studies and so on. But uh, the simple lesson is that uh, if you look at the value of an infrastructure or the cost. Uh, that is needed to provide a service, you should, by far, the biggest uh, cost comes after you construct that service, right? And success or failure of that infrastructure also depends on uh, what you do after the uh, construction of the piece of infrastructure. But decisions you take during the construction impact those decisions uh, that you take um, during the lifetime of the infrastructure. This is another little tool that we use to calculate, for example, uh, comparison of different investment strategies and come up with payback period, um, things like that. Uh, and uh, here's another um, example where, you know, um, we apply asset management in the drainage sector where, you know, we, um, we um, have developed a certain uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence based optimization routines that can use both uh, financial analysis uh, and hydraulic and hydrological analysis together to come up with how to have optimal life cycle strategies, um, both at the initial design and implementation phase, as well as uh, during the life cycle of those assets, how you can come up with optimal life cycle strategies so that you can provide best possible service under limited uh, amount, of, uh, amount of funding. Uh, finally, here's another tool that we use to look at you know, what is the cost benefit uh, picture of making investments uh, in the flood management. This case study is from the Mekong Delta um, uh, in Vietnam. Um, and there what we do is we, we provide this um, little asset management tools that uh, stakeholders can look at it and play 
different scenarios and try to understand that, you know, on the one hand, um, how much investment uh, you should make in certain things and what is the return on that investment in terms of reducing flood risk in this particular case. Um, in, in summary, uh, during uh, this short introduction to water infrastructure asset management, um, I discussed the, uh, the why question first, uh, why we need this kind of thinking. Uh, so build, neglect, uh, rebuild cycle is very much in action, especially in low, in, uh, in low and middle income countries due to various realities, but that is not only, only there. Around the world, this is a problem. So we waste huge investments sometimes by, you know, by not taking care of those investments after, the, uh, after their uh, implementation period. Water infrastructure asset management as a concept can provide uh, the backbone to break out of this BNR cycle and go beyond just construction projects. Look at water solutions as not only as projects that you need to quickly deliver and wash your hands off, but um, about as life cycle endeavors that you have to you know, deal with decades in, decade out. Now, about the solutions, we uh, at IHG, both our uh, education programs, as well as the research we have done, we promote uh, two types of action, bottom-up actions for this uh, and the top-down actions. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, this, uh, this uh, bottom-up and top-down should, should change here. Uh, top-down actions generally you know, are actions that need to be taken by big financiers, governments, uh, and people who provide the wherewithal to, you know, uh, to implement these solutions. There need to be some change happening there. And we have good news and bad news. The good news is that you know, looking at the reports and looking at the discussions we have with these organizations, the world is changing, but the bad news is slowly because these organizations have very big organizational inertia. So changing them is not easy, but um, at IHG, we are doing our part. Then we have the bottom of actions and we promote very much, I think earlier Yap was also presenting about, um, about related concepts, like very much about dealing with stakeholders, creating ownership of infrastructure at the lowest possible levels uh, in the infrastructure use, like among users, making making stakeholders into shareholders, we say, like make, make ownership a real thing for these people and dealing with societies and also capacity building and changing attitudes. I highlighted those two bottom-up initiatives because uh, these are like very real uh, things that we do at IHG uh, based on uh, our educational research and capacity development programs. So finally, this is one of one example of uh, the asset management related courses we offer at IHG. So with that, I will stop it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asala. Uh, well, if you have any questions about water infrastructure, please save it to the Q&A session. And now we'll uh, have Constantina's uh, keynote lecture, non sewer sanitation, a critical component towards sustainable development. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, I saw that we have quite a lot of representatives from different parts of the world. So I would say good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to this first uh, series of the keynotes. We really hope that you learn from our uh, presentations. And um, yeah, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact us um, even after the sessions uh, if you would like to hear more details. So. Um, I am going to speak about the water and health track and particularly my uh, focus is on non sewer sanitation. I am a senior lecturer in non sewer sanitation. So this is what I have been specializing, especially in the last 12 to 13 years of my career. I started uh, working with centralized wastewater. I have been working with waste, uh, solid waste management, uh, but um, moving to South Africa, um, more than 12, 13 years ago, helped me to realize that actually 
our focus needs to be a lot more shifted towards the non sewage sanitation. So let's see why. First of all, I wanted to start with a couple of myths that we are continu continuously dealing with. And um, um, just something for you to think about. You don't have to respond to that. But the first myth that I consider is not true is that access to toilet equals to safely manage sanitation. We have quite a lot of examples of people using toilets and having access to toilets to their homes or outside their homes, but the excreta is not safely managed and it ends into the environment. Another myth is that the toilet construction equals to toilet use. We've seen so many examples how brilliant engineers, they construct this, um, well, according to them, great innovations, and it, it, they are great if you, if you look at them from a technical perspective. But um, if you don't take into account the user, uh, the, the, the end users, um, what they would like to use, if you don't involve them into the process of installations, most likely you would end up not having these toilets used, not particularly for that purpose. Another saying, and it, this is very common, especially in Africa, we say uh, water is life, sanitation is dignity. But then often when we say this, we don't ask ourselves the question, where does the excreta go? So when we think about it, the excreta goes back to the water one way or another, whether we use sewer or non sewer whether it's treated or not. So they are interlinked. When we speak about water and sanitation, they're all interlinked together. And that's why we stress so much on the importance. And another, to me, myth is that we consider that if we achieve sewer sanitation, this equals to safely managed sanitation. Because this could be the case in countries like the Netherlands is a very great example of how it's uh, functioning properly. But we would see uh, some examples in uh, the global south where we see um, that installations of sewer sanitation are not um, actually so safely managed. So what is sewer versus non sewer? Um, I just thought, let me go through this part because I'm not sure how familiar all of you are about uh, that, uh, that topic. Um, when we speak about sewer sanitation, so this graph is representing the sanitation service chain, we speak about water closet, anything that we connect with a flushing system, which is connected to the pipe network, the sewers, usually underground, sometimes they could be over, and they um, usually end to a treatment plant where uh, we have different stages of treatment and then we have final end use and disposal of the product. When we speak about non sewer sanitation, we speak um, about on-site systems or anything that is not connected to the sewer. So um, it could be um, collected into pit latrines or septic tanks or um, any similar on-site facilities where this, um, we call the collection uh, fecal sludge, is um, staying for a specific period of time. They could be emptied after that um, and transported for to a treatment plant, or they could be closed and a new um, pit latrine, for example, is dug in the hole and um, constructed. So this is how conventionally we see them. But it's not so simple and it's becoming more and more complex. So if we want to speak about the sustainable development goals, and we would like to have a look at what is the distribution about safely managed with, um, uh, versus non-safely managed sanitation worldwide, we see that, um, well, the, on the left side, the graph shows um, in the very light yellow color, we see these are the countries that are considered having access to improved or safely managed sanitation. And these are mainly um, yeah, the regions of North America, Europe, and, um, and Australia. For the rest of the world, we see that it's becoming more and more unsafe, un un non-safely managed. And especially in the African continent, 
we see that this is becoming the bright red. So according to the JMP, um, about 43% of the world population in 2020 has been using on-site um, containment or so on-site um, sanitation systems. And you can see also from this uh, picture, um, they are mainly focused in the global south. And this has implications and a global impact. It's not, um, it's not that it's them and us and who, wherever you are. But if we see this holistically, this graph on the uh, bottom uh, right is, uh, is a little bit old, but it shows very well what is the burden of the world to the world uh, with dealing with um, the not having access to um, safely managed sanitation. And we see back in 2013, this was estimated to 260 billion US dollars per year. When we speak about sanitation and when we speak about sewered versus non-sewered and the connections with water usage, another aspect we have to consider is access to water resources. We can see on this graph, this is a model predicting what would be the water stress by country in 2040. So um, this means that the water that is consumed in this particular country or region is more than what is naturally uh, recovered through the water cycle. And we can see that it's becoming more and more of a problem, not only in countries that we saw um, in the previous graph uh, where we have the safely managed sanitation, but this links to how much water is used. And we see that larger part parts of the world would start becoming uh, water scarce or water stressed. Even Netherlands is becoming slowly water stressed, although there is the plenty of water. And you can see on the graph here on the um, uh, right, top uh, right. Um, so these are the estimations of what is the water usage per, um, per person um, in Europe, the big drop and the small drop is what is estimated by the uh, wo um, um, World Health Organization as, uh, as a minimum um, for um, um, daily, um, daily safely um, access to water. So we can see that there is not equal distribution, but also we are going to have a big problem uh, looking in the future. Another big um, and important aspect is the urbanization. So we see that about two thirds of the um, world, world's population would be focused in Africa and Asia. And then this also brings complexities when we come to management to water uh, resources and sanitation respectively. Another reality that we deal, relate, deal with related to the urbanization is unequal distribution. So um, you can see those photos show very well and probably a lot of you can relate in your own countries. There's particular regions, particularly in the global south, uh, larger metropolitan cities where we have um, just right next to each other um, informal settlements or slums, and then right next to them, really nicely managed and beautiful areas. But this also speaks not only about the distribution of, of wealth in terms of well-being and where we live, but also it shows us that access to sanitation actually is another uh, social barrier, because usually we don't, uh, these um, um, 
people living in the densely populated slum areas, they don't have access to sewer um, systems. They would rarely have access in their homes, particularly to sanitation or to toilets. So they have to deal with the most basic forms of sanitation. But at the same time, their neighbors that are living in the better neighborhoods, they would not have this problem. They would just usually flush and forget about that problem. However, if we have a look at certain places in the world, um, we can see that even if we have sewers and access to sewers, even if we have some form of uh, wastewater treatment, not all and everything that has been treated, it actually safe to be discharged. And we see more and more increasing uh, evidence on how the sewerage that is going into the um, uh, oceans and seas previously it was considered okay it's a large volume that it's been diluted but now we see that uh, it has a, an impact on coral reefs on um, marine ecosystems we see here um, Asela mentioned infrastructure asset management similar issue we are dealing when we when it comes to sanitation so when we have wastewater treatment plants particularly in some countries i've seen i've worked a lot in the southern um, african region we see a um, subsidized um, construction of wastewater treatment plants but the operation and maintenance has not been considered so what happens is that actually there is not enough revenue or there are a lot of other factors that um, the local government or the, the utilities have to deal with. So eventually these wastewater treatment plants don't function properly. And of course, when we speak about um, on-site sanitation, there are a lot of other problems that come uh, with this challenge. So you can see some pictures and photos of examples when the pits are full, when there is not particular emptying, how um, there is not a, a clear barrier, and when there is not access to proper sanitation, everything can run off um, on the streets uh, or even in the next neighborhood. So when we speak uh, and look at fundamentally how we distribute resources, we see that um, about um, we generate per person per per year about um, 550 uh, kilograms or liters of urine, um, and then um, for the feces is just 51. So. This in total accounts for 610 kilograms per person per year. But when we start mixing it with flush water coming from the uh, wastewater, uh, from the usage of toilet, when we use between six to eight liters of, of um, flushing water, then the amount increases to 18,000. And in the most of the cases, the pathogens are concentrated in the feces, the nutrients are in the urine. So that's why sometimes we speak about separation at source. And there are some um, additional thoughts about it. When we think about it, we invest all the resources purifying water to a standard which is drinkable water standard, right? Portable water, the most of the cases. And we still, every time we go to the toilet for half a liter of urine or 200 grams of feces, we use six to eight liters of this already purified water that we invested a lot of resources to have. Then we flush it down the drain. And then all of this has to travel all the way through the sewer system to reach to a wastewater treatment plant where we have to additionally invest a lot of energy um, electricity, uh, additional resources to treat it and discharge it again in the water bodies, but usually the discharge quality meets barely the standards, which is not exactly the same quality as it used to be before even being taken to be treated. So this is the cycle we are usually thriving into, but 
why don't we look at other options? And speaking about shifting towards sustainable development, speaking about limited um, water resources, why do we always consider that this is um, that necessarily is the cure for everything? So just to share with you a couple of examples on what we have been looking at as um, part of how we can actually look at the excreta that has been generated, particularly from non sewage sanitation systems, um, and how um, we can incorporate them into the circular economy model. So, for example, if we look at the sanitation service chain at the containment level, we can look at um, some innovations which are already in process of development. Some of them are quite progressed on how we can treat everything at source and um, we have to we can shorten the the chain um, for further treatment um, for the uh, emptying transportation and treatment. So there's been um, these innovations um, called reinvented toilets, really looking at the whole concept and how everything is treated off the grid, on site, and generating um, valuable products. But more of all, offering a dignified solution to, to the users, something that everybody would use. I would not... For example, we speak we always with the colleagues that we would not offer a solution to someone that we would not use ourselves. So some of these systems are in different development stages and we look um, in the program of uh, some examples on that. Um, so this is one of the examples looking at production of electricity from urine uh, through uh, microbial fuel cells, um, which is enough to charge your mobile phone or light up um, a bulb in the toilet. That's an example of um, how we use um, 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 membrane bioreactors for treatment of uh, what is generated in the toilet. So it could be a mix of black water excreta with flush, or it could be also with gray water coming from uh, showering. Uh, they could be combined with um, uh, community gardens or hydro um, ponics in the back. So because they, they are rich in nutrients, but what they do is close the loop and the cycle. So the water that has been treated could be reflushed over and over again. This is another example of um, uh, one of um, our professor, uh, Damir uh, Brjanovic. He has developed this kind of a system, which is mostly for early, early stage um, um, detection of uh, possibilities of outbreaks. So this kind of toilet is quite um, 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 stackable or it's very easy to dismantle or put together. So then um, the applications that um, had been used as, uh, at um, humanitarian uh, settings or emergency settings uh, or in inf informal settlements. And of course, when we speak about non sewage sanitation, um, the aspiration for innovations um, at the capture or the early stage of the sanitation service chain is um, um, it, it, it would take some time. But we are looking at also innovations that could treat and uh, recover resources at um, uh, in if, if we have pit latrines or septic tanks that have been emptied, how this uh, um, sludge is being treated. So that's one example from an omniprocessor which is in um, which is in the car in Senegal and there is a lot of production of, um, of electricity. Um, uh, there is a production of pure water and then a small amount of ash. So just to finish off, we are very much behind on the progress of achieving how, um, where we are going or what the targets are for the sustainable development goals, particularly for provision of safely managed water and sanitation. And um, 
this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to focus on what would be the solutions and how we expedite this process. And of course, we need more uh, we need more experts, um, potential experts like you, that would bring this progress much further. Um, and then with, uh, this is my last slide. Um, I just wanted to mention how the non sewage sanitation is linked to um, a lot of interdisciplinary um, other studies within the program and generally how it's been covered. So we, we look at citywide inclusive sanitation. Um, there's um, engineering aspects, but at the same time, there are quite a lot of governance and management aspects, seeing how um, we um, direct and the whole planning of the sanitation systems. Um, also, it interlinks a lot with behavior change and community. I mentioned to you how we install this innovative system systems and how we manage to um, communicate with the um, local population and the final users. It links a lot with public health, uh, water resource management and groundwater management, financing and business models, ecosystems health, um, climate change, very important. We look at more and more evidence on how um, to mitigate or, or to adopt um, non sewer sanitation systems, preparing for climate change, and there are many agricultural applications of the treated product. We also look through a gender lens, um, how to overcome taboos, gender-based violence related to non sewage sanitation, many different cultural aspects, um, inclusive solutions, uh, which leaves no one behind, um, innovation, context-specific design solutions, laboratory versus field, um, related research, modeling, um, and uh, sharing practical exercises from different regions of the world. So these are the colleagues from our group. And um, yeah, I will leave it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Constantina. Uh, Asiala, I believe you need to leave because you have another class soon. So uh, feel free to not uh, join during the Q&A session. Uh, I, I believe it's fine if you all have any questions about the keynote lectures, uh, feel free to email me after. Uh, as I understood uh, from the chat, I think the main questions are about admissions and uh, scholarships and tuition fee. Uh, so uh, I believe that Inika, maybe you can uh, jump in. Uh, there were uh, several questions. Maybe we can start with the first one. So scholarships to India, Sri Lanka, Zimbabwe, Malawi. Uh, Cameroon and uh, Uganda. Uh, those are, I think, uh, were the main countries that were asking for scholarships. Do we still have anything open? Uh, no, for these countries it's difficult. We do have IHC partial scholarships available. You can find the information also uh, among the scholarship information. So we do have the hardship scholarship that offers a 25% reduction in the tuition fee and the water leader scholarship for the regular MSc and the top scientist scholarship for the research master that offers 40% uh, reduction in the tuition fee. But uh, yes, also important that applicants apply for admission because sometimes it happens that throughout the application year, suddenly scholarships come available. And then we check in the list of applicants who are admitted and we inform all admitted applicants about this opportunity. So if you are interested in the program but do not have funding, do not wait with applying for admission, but submit your application because we also do not know exactly if new opportunities uh, will come in. And is there uh, still any scholarship available for this academic uh, year that is going to begin uh, in October? Beg your pardon? We, for the next uh, academic year, do we still have any scholarships available? Yes, we have to know what the development partnership program, but that's for specific uh, regions like Horn of Africa, the MENA, countries and uh, small island development uh, states and Sahel countries. The, all the countries are mentioned on uh, the website. Mm -hmm. um, for the, the World Bank, that, uh, the deadline was already in uh, February, so that has passed. 
and uh, Rotary, the scholarship, uh, the scholarship has also passed because you should apply with the IHDL for the first of April. And for the Rotary scholarship itself, that was on the 15th of April. So, so there are just a few days. So it's mm -hmm. also too late now. I believe we still have scholarships for Latin America, right? Latin America. Still, uh, yeah, I didn't see a question about Latin America scholarship, but there are also these cover 50% um, okay. of the okay. cost. Another question that popped up several times was about paying in installment, but that's not possible. Uh, if you are a self-payer, you will need to pay before yeah, the academic tuition fee and show that you have sufficient funding to cover the cost, because that's a requirement to get the Netherlands uh, visa. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have another question. I think this will not be to you, Enneke. How does the program incorporate field work or practical experiences in conflict affected areas like Yemen and uh, does not in partner with NGOs or uh, these activities for these activities? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe yeah, I can, I can give a, um, <clears throat> an answer to that. Um, so as an organization, we are, of course, uh, responsible for the, the, the safety of our staff and of our uh, students. And like short missions uh, from the staff, also for the students, uh, we follow the, the, the guidelines of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in uh, the country, if it's a green, yellow, orange, or a red code. So in conflict zones, um, if it's red, you are not allowed to go. If it's orange, you need to receive an approval uh, from the rectorate itself, so the highest level of uh, management. Then, of course, there is so often a difference that we make um, but it, it is up to the decision of the rectorate in that case, if you are from that country yourself or if you are foreign to that um, country, yeah? because that matters also in cases of uh, your possibilities in these. But we follow basically the guidelines from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to allow for um, field missions to those kind of areas. Um, there is another question still from the same person about who is your ideal candidate? The ideal teams. candidate is um, is the motivated candidate. Okay, good answer. Uh, another question. Is there an employment advantage at the UN after having these uh, masters? <laughs> the, the simple answer is yes. Okay. Yeah, we have can, to, uh... I, can I mention something? I, I just want to mention to our prospective uh, students that um, I think a lot uh, before starting the program aspire to work at the UN, but during the program, um, a lot changes. So we see that a lot of uh, a lot of the students actually change their mind because you see that there is so much broader application of, of your studies in different areas. So um, there is a lot more out there than the UN. <laughs> yeah, and um, in simple terms also, um, so it is a Master of Science diploma recognized under Dutch uh, education law so that is also the status then of your diploma so that would require you to uh, jobs that require a, a higher level of education that require academic uh, level of education skills and indeed they these are found beyond the world and i think we want to stimulate you indeed to think about also your future career um, when selecting your learning trajectory here at ihe um, and indeed, it might also rethink you where you can have your most valuable impact uh, to the world. We also uh, did um, a study with our alumni and we understood that uh, all of, like the majority of them, it was a very high uh, percentage, actually got a better position in their own company. Uh, so it, it really helped uh, several people already. Um, I have another question. If you can start now applying for the next academic year, Ineke? Uh, no, not yet now. That opens on the 1st of October. Okay. So, but it's good to, yeah, you to apply already now for this mission for uh, this year, because then we can check already if you can be admitted and in case scholarship opportunities will suddenly come, then you may still be eligible. 
And if you are academically admitted, you are for the period of three years, right? Uh, well, yeah, that, that usually it is for three years, but you will have to reapply again okay. because we need, again, all the application documents. Okay. And is it possible to take the pre uh, preparatory course now? Uh, if so, how? It's only open uh, courseware, so that's possible. Okay. Uh, the English test uh, for under a uh, war country like Ethiopia. Yeah, there are possibilities to do the TOEFL IBT home edition test for uh, countries who have difficulties in doing uh, in doing the test. Okay. So applicants can can check that option. Okay, but if you have more questions about these kind of things, feel free to email me and we'll uh, uh, help you out. Um, more. Mm. So challenges with scholarships. Yeah, I, I think at the end, uh, we, we don't have many scholarships uh, available uh, now. We do have the the one that we just uh, mentioned, but not for all the countries. So uh, next time, uh, be sharp uh, with the scholarship deadlines. Mm. OK, can you provide some insight into the interdisciplinary project uh, close to the end of the program? Where is it going to be held? How does it work? Uh, yep. Maybe, yeah. Thank yeah, you. we are organizing um, that in several sites in France, um, in the southern part of France, in the Camargue, which is a national area or around Montpellier, but also in the area of Nantes. Um, yeah. So that is where we organize it. Um, so that, and uh, but it's, it's then always organized around a particular uh, water challenge. And as mentioned during my presentation, you will work then together with fellow students from different tracks uh, and profiles on this assignment. And so really to support that you are using the knowledge that you have the, um, acquired during your program, so in modules one to seven, that you apply that in that interdisciplinary project and that you bring your knowledges of your different team members together. And um, there's also another question uh, about coaching. So uh, how is our support? Uh, also, if we uh, provide any extra support uh, when students finish the masters in searching for work opportunities? So, so at, when you are at IHN, it starts a little bit before. Uh, so when you are fully admitted and uh, it's known that you are coming to Delft, then um, a few months in advance of the start of the program, you will be contacted uh, by your coach. So every student is assigned a coach and a coach normally has a number of students, let's say four to five students uh, that he or she will coach. Uh, and you will be contacted by the coach for a first online um, meeting. And um, you will have discussions with your coach about your future ambitions. Eh? What do you want to do after this program in order to start thinking about uh, your learning trajectory? Eh? So what kind of knowledge and skills do you need to actually be able to uh, fulfill your dream ambitions of the, uh, the, the near future? Um, and you can have as much contact um, basically with your coach uh, that you uh, want or need um, to think about the organization of your program. What we often see after the program, so on a certain moment, you're going to start with your MSc thesis and you will develop a close collaboration with your uh, daily supervisor, your mentor that we are called, and your supervisor. So the, the professor who's the final responsible person for your academic work. And well, from my personal experience, it is the students with whom I have worked on their thesis in the past, who I also support afterwards. And so in case of that, somebody would like to have a reference letter because they apply for a certain job, that they contact me and say, yeah, I'm now applying to this position. Would you like to support me with the reference letter? And basically, I always do. So um, you, you build up different uh, relations with different people when you are here. Um, that also support you into your future. Right? It's, it's, uh, you will develop, if you are here, you will be, develop uh, uh, lifelong friendships also with people that also will support you in your future. 
Okay, uh, we still have a lot of questions, but we will not be able to answer everyone. Uh, so what I would suggest is that uh, tomorrow I'm going to send a recording of this webinar. I'll also be sharing the presentations with you and feel free to answer back with the questions that were not answered today. Uh, we will apologize for that, but uh, we are already a bit behind uh, and uh, my colleagues need to give some lectures. Uh, so, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Konstantina Yapenica, uh, for uh, being here today. Also, Stella, but he's not here anymore. Uh, and, uh, well, see you next Wednesday uh, if you'd like to join the next uh, webinar. If not, uh, feel free to send me an email. Thank you very much. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye -bye. Good luck. Have a good day. Hope to see Bye. you soon in Dell. <laughs>